pre-Columbian and early African art. When we left off last class period, we talked about the importance of Greek columns in our modern architecture, as well as their importance in Greek society. Um, today, we're going to start off talking about some Roman architecture. So they created about four things that really did allow like innovative use and design of buildings. Those are arches, vaults, and domes. And those were also made possible by them expanding how they used concrete in their con in their construction. These innovations allowed them to create these very large open spaces without any inner supports. So previously we would have had to have some sort of support structure running down the center of a room or through a room in order to create um, a, a room that wouldn't cave in on itself. But now, because of these innovations, we don't have to have that anymore. So the first one is a barrel vault, and it's a deep arch forming a half cylindrical roof. So we have half of a cylinder here. The second type of vault that we're going to talk about is a groin vault, and this is two intersecting barrel vaults at right angles. So here we have one barrel vault, and a second barrel vault. And so they meet at a right angle and then they fo form these groins. One type of structure in particular that has stood the test of time is something called a Roman basilica. And so these are rectangular buildings, often with semicircular apses on either end. And these would kind of make the building look like an oblong shape. Um, they often had windows placed high on the walls in order to let in a light of lot and air, uh, let in a lot of light and air. Um, during ancient Roman times, we have to remember that our modern conception of what a basilica is, is not what a Roman basilica was. Our modern concept of a basilica is a church. Theirs was not a church. It was a meeting place. There were law courts held there. There were marketplaces. Um, it has been adopted, again, by Catholics and other Christians as an architectural style, but the ancient Roman basilicas were not religious houses. So here we have the Basilica Julia. Now, this is a modern rendering of what this building would have looked like. We do have some details on what the building itself looked like, but unfortunately, the building itself is still not standing anymore. So you can see here we've got... Um, a series of vaults running ar along the outside. Um, you can see um, columns and you can see um, three levels with lots of windows at the top, which would have let in light and air. Now let's talk about one of my favorite buildings. This is the Colosseum. And the Colosseum grew, drew inspiration from uh, Greece. So they had Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns. So again, not only do we steal from uh, previous cultures, but so did the Romans. The Romans really liked the idea of these columns. They also had Roman arches and concrete. Now, the really cool thing about the Colosseum is that it would seat between 50 to 80,000 people. So just for a reference, Lambeau currently seats 80,785. So this was an incredibly enormous structure. And remember, we're talking about ancient times here. They didn't have modern cranes. They didn't have modern building techniques. And the Colosseum is still mostly standing. Um, I think it's really cool that once they flooded the, the Colosseum to stage naval reenactment. So I'd like you to imagine, like, you know, Governor Evers wants to flood Lambeau to stage a naval reenactment. Um, like the sheer engineering of that whole situation would be absolutely mind blowing in a modern sense, but even in a, um, you know, an ancient sense that took a lot of engineering and architectural know-how. Modern stadiums are still inspired by the efficient layout of the Colosseum. So this is the Colosseum as it looks today. Um, at the bottom, you can see the Doric columns Ionic columns are on the second story, and the third column has the Corinthian columns. Um, 
You can see over here in this corner, there are some people. There's a very small person right here. Those things really highlight the sheer enormous size of this building. So if you do go to Rome, you can absolutely still see the Colosseum. This is an aerial shot of the Colosseum. I think this does really give you sort of that large scale sense of how big this building actually was or is because it's still standing. So let's talk briefly about Roman sculpture. They wanted to combine that perfect Greek sculpture. So remember how beautiful those bodies looked earlier this week with a more realistic style. So most surviving Roman sculpture is made from marble or stone, but there are some artists who did work with metal, glass, and clay. So let's talk about Pompeii because we do have some of these pieces of art that exist from Pompeii. And Pompeii was a resort community. It was very luxurious. It was also known as a trading hub, but it was destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius on August 24th, 79 AD, which was this last Monday. So Monday was the 24th. So we're very close in time to the anniversary of Vesuvius erupting. The eruption destroyed the city and covered it in 18 feet of ash pumice. So this is an absolutely massive amount of ash. And it essentially buried the entire community and preserved it until it was rediscovered in 1779. I have a link here to a video on Pompeii. You are free to watch it um, and go back at another time. I will link it in a um, in the description box below. Pompeii villas were often decorated with these beautiful, elaborate um, still lifes and scenes of battles or landscapes. They often would mimic the ideal of like looking out a window and seeing a beautiful vista. And they would go back and use those trompe l'oeil techniques that we talked about in the last class period when we talked about Greek paintings. The villas were decorated with intricate mosaics, and I'm going to show you one mosaic in particular, but it is absolutely fantastic. So here we have the house of the Veti Ion Room in Pompeii, and you can see this idea of a faux sort of window. So these aren't actually windows, they are paintings on the wall that give the illusion of windows in a closed space. Now, this is that mosaic I was telling you about. So this is one of the fish mosaics that um, is really incredible. So we're going to zoom in. So you can really start to see all the tiny, beautiful glass um, mosaic tiles that create this piece. It's very, very intricate and very, very detailed. So we have an eel here. We have um, an octopus. We have a whole bunch of other types of fish. We have a squid up here in the right-hand corner, but by far is this fish is my favorite. Um, I loved the sh sort of like shocked look and expression on his face. Um, he looks surprised like, like you shouldn't be looking at him, um, but you really can see this incredible amount of detail here. Look at the scales that are happening here. So this is the gill. And you can even see they've they've gone in and, and added additional detail. I love that they added in the detail of the eyelashes, like like this fish. It just looks like it has these beautiful, lush, full eyelashes. So now we're going to move on and talk about pre-Columbian art. So there were lots of cultures across Mesoamerica, Central and South America, that created these beautiful visual art objects. And these were often stand-ins for written language. And what we have to remember is that visual art tells the story of a particular culture, religion, and philosophy. So we're going to look at this beautiful breastplate from Colombia. This is a crocodile god hammered breastplate. And so you can see it's incredibly detailed, very, very rich and sumptuous looking. This gold is just absolutely breathtaking. It like illuminates the crocodile god that is here in the center. Very stylized, which was common for, for this type of um, artifact. 
And then here we have a Mayan vase. So we have this very beautiful uh, Mayan vase and uh, some aspects of it, you know, remind me of some of the things that we saw in a in the Egyptian paintings. Um, so we have this sort of very flat plane happening. Um, they have a better sense of perspective. They don't have that um, unusual stylized, you know, weird torso twisting happening here, but we have this very much a profile view of, of an activity on this beautiful Mayan vase and this gorgeous red color really offset against this creamy background. So Machu Picchu is an Inca estate for an emperor that was constructed over the course of about 10 years. And I bring up the 10 years because I think it was really, really impressive. The fact that they were able to achieve this level of architectural engineering in 10 years when you see the location of this place. Um, it was abandoned about 80 years later, and it was rediscovered in about 1911. It has these beautiful terraces. So again, 10 years. This is what we're talking about here. They were able to achieve in 10 years. They must have had an absolutely massive workforce uh, creating all of these terraces. So not only are these terraces decorative, so each one of these little flat planes here, those terraces are not only decorative, but they help prevent erosion. So this would have been the main part of the structure um, that people would have lived and worked in. So this would have really been like a palace complex for for one of the, um, uh, you know, elite ruling class. And then we had all these beautiful terraces that kind of, you know, waterfall down this uh, mountaintop. You can still go see Machu Picchu today. It's supposed to be absolutely phenomenal. It's definitely on my list of things to do. And then here we have some wooden grave Mapuche effigies, and these have come from about the 19th century. So you can see here, these are very, very stylized. Look at, it's a very solid, you know, stylized sense of, of a nose. And then we have a stylized idea of where the eyes are and where the mouth is. And then the body is very, very rough hewn. And here we have the Anasazi seed pot. Now this, the design on this should look vaguely familiar to you. I feel like the design of this really echoes some of the line design that we did your first week as a freshman um, when, we got, when we did the Zen line design. So we have these beautiful thinner lines here contrasting with like these fatter white lines contrasting with this, you know, um, thicker, more solid black space. And then we have, you know, these geometric forms. Um, there isn't a whole lot of organic happening here unless you count the shape of the pot itself. But, you know, everything else here is very, very geometric and it's really absolutely beautiful. Now, one of the coolest things I think that we get to talk about is something called the Native American mounds. These are all over. We do have some here in Wisconsin. In fact, it was only about five or so years ago that another one was discovered here in Milwaukee. And it was literally discovered by someone who was familiar with Native American mounds. And he was on a walk. I believe it was up by Brown Deer. And he was like, on a walk on a bike path. And he was like, that looks like a Native American mound. And he was absolutely right. And so these had a variety of uses. Some of them were religious, some of them were burial, some of them had a ceremonial purpose. Um, by far, my favorite one is in Southern Ohio. It's called the Great Serpent Mound. Um, there's a wonderful video. Again, I will link it in the description box below. But this is what the Great Serpent Mound looks like from above. So here at the end, we can see a curling serpent tail, and then the body of the serpent weaves through the countryside here, and this is the head. And the head is actually swallowing an egg. I have a different view here, so you can kind of see. So here's the head, and the serpent is swallowing an egg. And so it's absolutely beautiful. It ripples and runs through through the land. Now this is a park, you can go and see it. I highly recommend you go see it. It's off of Route 32 um, in Southern was, or in Southern Ohio. Really an amazing thing to see. And again, remember, this was all constructed without the use of aerial mapping. It was all done by hand, um, you know, with primitive tools. Um, and so I think that makes the 
you know, architectural layout of this. Um, absolutely fantastic. Okay, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about early African art. This is not the only time we're going to talk about African art. We do have a project coming up on African art um, in a couple of weeks in which we'll start to get into some other aspects of it. But I did want to spend some time talking about early African art. So again, early African art, um, most of the, what we have are engravings and um, carvings from rocks and some masks. Unfortunately, we have lost a lot of the other artifacts that probably existed um, simply due to the nomadic lifestyle of the early peoples in Africa. So here we have Algeria's Tassili in Agir, and again, I, I, I may be mangling some of these names, but here you can see this animal engraved into the side of a rock. And that's one of the reasons why we continue to have this piece because again, rocks are very hard. And so luckily they stand the test of time. So this would be an example of engraving. We saw an example of relief and three-dimensional sculpture um, earlier in the week. And this would be an example of engraving. So someone actually like carved these lines into the rock. The other thing I wanted to talk about was something called the African terracotta figures. Now these are stylized and are semi-abstract. They often feature elaborate hairstyles. Um, they have exaggerated facial features. So here you can see this hairstyle is very elaborate and gorgeous. The facial features are way exaggerated. So I mean, no one has facial features that actually look like this. And that was done on purpose. It was part of the style. Um, I mean, no one really has a chin that 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 deep it's an it's an exaggeration no one's eyes you know start at the the bridge of their nose and come all the way back to their ears but notice the beautiful headdress that is happening here absolutely lovely so some later African sculpture had these long stretched bodies and these forms were inspired by trees. So you can see here, these bodies in particular have very much like these knots on them, like the, like a tree would have knots. The, the arms and legs are very skinny. You can even see that some of the body structure feels very reminiscent of some of that ancient Egyptian art that we looked at, very rigid and stiff. Um, so it really reminds you of those trees. So look how rigid and tall this was. And you have to remember lots of Africa doesn't have, um, you know, um, especially in the desert areas, there are not a lot of trees. There are quite for heavily forested areas though too. And in those areas, they really um, love their tree-like sculptures. So that is it for, to for this section of notes. Please come back when we have more notes that are gonna be coming up next week.